at CanCov, whether you're online or here in person, we uh, say good morning and a happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. A couple of announcements here before we get started. One, just a reminder that on May 30th, we're changing the worship time to 10 a.m., 10 a.m. That's both in person and online. And of course, uh, if you miss that, it'll be on, we were, we we're gonna put that service, that recording online so you can worship anytime after that. A Couple other things um, is to note is that the pastoral search committee is going to be sending out a survey, a demographic survey in just a little while, you can look for details about that a little on later in the middle of the week. So be watching for that. And also, there is going to be a middle school parents meeting on Sunday, May 23rd from 5 to 6 p.m. in the Student Center. That's both online and in person. If you're going to be doing that online, please contact Janith for information about how to get online. And a special note is we would like the parents of current fifth graders to come to that meeting because they'll be joining the program in the summer. All right, I think that's about it. And let's gather and worship. Amen. Thank you, Dan. Um, good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day. Welcome. Thank you for joining us, whether you're here in this room, at home. It's great to be with you. Great to worship with you as a family, as a church, uh, as the body of the risen Lord. So let's stand as we're able, uh, if you're able, and join as we get to worship God together. A lot of times for a call to worship, I find it appropriate uh, to read a psalm or something like that, but I thought this morning we'd just sing it. Is that okay? I'm going to sing from Psalm 63. Shadow of your outstretched wings, my soul. 
ourselves to you love you and say we thank you we worship you this morning for who you are father son holy spirit we love you and pray this in jesus name amen amen you can go ahead and have a seat amen good morning kent cove i am pastor tarina and i am going to lead us in a time of prayer and during that time, there will be some moments of silence. And so I'm just giving you a heads up about that. And then keep in mind as we're praying, our brothers and sisters that are here in this room and also online, we are praying as one body in community. This is not an individual experience. So just keep that in mind as we pray. And at the end, I will also be praying for our offering, and there are several ways to give. You can see them on the screen. Um, <clears throat> there's also should be a link online for you. And um, if you are here in the sanctuary, there are baskets um, at the back on the ushers' tables. All right? Let's pray. Living God, <clears throat> to you, no door is closed. No heart is locked. Your love and grace abound. Even in dark times, your life shines bright and you fill us with great joy. We give you praise, praise too great for words, Lord. We love you, God, with all that we are, and yet we still sin. Almighty God, who forgives and heals, we need your healing. Merciful God, give us true repentance. Some sins are plain to us and some escape us. And some we simply cannot face. We humbly come to you now, confessing our sins. Thank you, Lord, for your everlasting mercy and forgiveness. We vow to be more sensitive to your spirit and committed to your will. Father God, on this Mother's Day, we lift up the women who gave us life. We pray for every woman who is raising children now, making sacrifices for her children as they become the people that you have created them to be. We pray for the aunties and the grandmas and adoptive and foster moms, those who mother in ways that prove love extends beyond biological ties. We pray for women who grieve the loss of a child, born and unborn. We thank you for all of these mothers 
recognizing that motherhood comes in many forms, and we give you thanks for all of these women now. Sovereign Lord, God of all nations, we pray now for India. The pandemic is raging and the loss of life is heartbreaking. We specifically lift up our sisters and brothers of the Hindustani Covenant Church. They have lost so many loved ones, pastors, family, friends, and the losses are devastating. We intercede on behalf of the people of India. Most holy God, our relationship with you is both mysterious and also tangible. We touch the world and our community with prayer, love, and grace, but also with practical resources. So as we give today, we do so knowing that you will multiply our offerings for the well-being of all who benefit from them. Let our gifts of time and resources be evidence of strength that is not our own. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And now um, I have prepared a kid's message for the kids and kids at heart. So check out the screen. Today, we are learning about a mom who said yes to God, even though God was asking her to do something huge. Our story is about Mary, mother of Jesus. Now, last week's story was about Gideon, and that was in the Old Testament. And Mary's story is told in the New Testament. So when we go from the last page of the Old Testament to the New Testament, we really just turn a couple pages. But in that time, there were almost 400 years that had passed. And all of that time, generation after generation, the people of Israel, they were waiting for the Messiah, the one that God promised would come to save them. So in the time just before Jesus was born, Israel was once again under someone else's control. This time, it was the Romans. And the people of Israel, they longed to be rescued, and they wondered if the Messiah would ever come. Well, the answer was on the way. Something amazing happened. The angel Gabriel came to Mary. Now, she was engaged to marry a man named Joseph but they weren't married yet. So when Mary saw the angel, she was afraid, but Gabriel said to her, don't be afraid. God is very pleased with you. You are going to have a baby son and you're going to call him Jesus. He will be the most special baby that has ever been born because God himself is going to be his father. God will make him a king in the family line of David, and he will reign over a kingdom that will never end. 
Well, as you can imagine, Mary had some questions and she asked, how will this happen since I am not married yet? And Gabriel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and because of this, Jesus will be the son of God. Mary believed what the angel said and she said, I serve the Lord. May it happen to me just as you said it would. In other words, Mary was saying, okay, sounds good. Let's do this. And because Mary said yes to God's plan, then Jesus was born. It's like she opened the door for God to use her in such an important way. But what if Mary had said no to God's plan? What if she closed the door and then locked it to God, refusing to be part of God's plan? If she had said no to God, then maybe she would have named Jesus with a different name. Or maybe she would have been angry towards God instead of excited at how God was using her. That could have caused her to raise Jesus very differently. Or what if she never even had Jesus? Wow, it's a lot to think about for sure. You know, I pray that if God ever wants to use me in an important way, that I trust him enough to say yes. Don't you? All right, friends, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Mary who said yes to your plan. Help us to also say yes to the plans that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bye, friends. Good morning, Ken Cuff. It's good to see you all this morning. We're going to have a little Christmas on Mother's Day. Our text comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. I'm going to read that for us right now. Luke writes, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O God, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meet. Amen. Well, this morning, as we continue to look at witnesses and think about these people in the story of God who uh, welcomed God, who said yes to God, who God used to further his kingdom and his plan and his pursuit of his people, we want to look at 
really two women. We're going to focus primarily on Mary, but two mothers who said yes to God. So one of the things as we get comfortable with one another, I know I've been here a few months now, but um, you're going to learn, I think, over time that sometimes I... You know, I chase some rabbit trails. My, I have ADD, and so shiny things, right? They just, I'll, get, I'll go down a rabbit trail in a heartbeat. And, and as I was preparing for this sermon this morning, I found a rabbit trail that I think uh, you will find interesting. So if you'll indulge me, I want to share a Mother's Day poem with you. This is from uh, one of my favorite poets whose name is Billy Collins. He was Poet Laureate of the United States years ago. This poem is called The Lanyard. The other day, I was ricocheting slowly off the blue walls of this room, moving as if underwater from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, when I found myself in the L section of the dictionary, where my eye fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one into the past more suddenly. A past where I sat at a workbench at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake, learning how to braid long, thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one, if that's what you did with them. But that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts, and I gave her a lanyard. She nursed me in many a sick room, lifted spoons of medicine to my lips, laid cold face cloths on my forehead, and and then led me out into the airy light, and taught me to walk and swim. And I, in turn, presented her with a lanyard. Here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing and a good education. And here is your lanyard, I replied, which I made with a little help from a counselor. Here is a breathing body, and a beating heart, strong legs, bones, and teeth, and two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here, I said, is the lanyard I made at camp. And here, I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift, not the worn truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hand, I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. So this poem shows and gives us this picture of what motherhood is like. And really, I want to recognize, as Tarina did in our prayer, that motherhood is, can be a fraught a conversation, right? We all have varied experiences of our parents. Some come from places and homes that were beautiful and loving and nurturing, and others come from homes that were broken and where hurt was present and all of those things, and it's oftentimes a mixed up bag. But underneath it all, we recognize that the mothers who give us life do so out of a out of a a selfless love. And we sometimes, especially as children, present them with a lanyard. And so as I was thinking about motherhood and these mothers in particular from Scripture, it struck me that if there were ever two mothers who might not relate to the humor of Billy Collins, it would probably be Mary and Elizabeth. For their sons were John John and Jesus. John, the announcer of the coming kingdom of God. The one who uh, prepared the way for the Messiah. 
the one who spoke truth to power in Herod, and Mary, the one who, who theo theologians call the God-bearer, the one who brought Jesus into the world. They brought their mothers something other than a lanyard. But I think it's important as we look and we think about what it means to be witnesses that we consider the witness of these two women for us. These two women in Roman-occupied Palestine have things to teach us about faith and joy. Let's look at Elizabeth first. Elizabeth, who is the wife of a simple country priest, who goes to the temple, who... I like to make up a little story about Zechariah, right? So Zechariah is a priest in Nazareth, and the way it worked was there was kind of this lottery system where you would get called up to serve in the temple. And I can only imagine what an honor it would be for a simple country priest to be called to the temple to serve, right? I mean, that in and of itself would be amazing. I mean, I try to imagine myself when I was serving small congregations in the Midwest of just over a hundred people. Imagine that my name came up in some pastoral lottery and it was my turn to pray at the inauguration, or it was my turn to preach at the National Cathedral, or it was my turn to, you know, do some great amazing thing. The pride and the and kind of the trembling that would come with that. And then Zechariah goes to the temple, and when he goes there, he has a vision that says his wife is going to have a baby. This makes no sense. And he basically says so. And the angel strikes him mute. Elizabeth gives birth to John. And when Mary comes to visit Elizabeth, which happens immediately after the part of the text that we read this morning, her greeting to Mary is this, an affirmation of Mary's faith in verse 45. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord would, will fulfill his promises to her to her. This is astounding. This kind of faith from these two simple women, right? I mean, imagine being beyond the age of childbearing and your husband coming home after his big uh, debut at the temple to tell you, guess what, honey? I met an angel and you're going to have a baby. Surprise! And then to find out that your cousin, who isn't even married yet, is also pregnant. And not only is she pregnant, but the circumstances around that are dicey, and she has welcomed it. And so when she comes to visit, you see in her that faith, and you greet her with, Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. It's so beautiful. But we have to recognize that for us, it might have been a little more complex than it appears on the surface. I imagine that Elizabeth had a lot of questions. I imagine that Mary had even more. Imagine, if you will, Mary, a young, pregnant peasant girl who is not yet married. Imagine what this means in that culture. According to the law, she could be stoned. Even if she is shown mercy and not stoned to death, she most certainly would have been cast aside. She would have been ostracized. She would have been, in terminology that I fear to use, canceled. Right? And yet... Mary's response is even more astounding than Elizabeth's. 
Mary's response in verse 38 is a humble openness. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Mary welcomes this amazing, crazy, unbelievable news with openness and wonder. Her response exemplifies humble service and hope. As I mentioned, there is really every reason for her to despair or to reject this assignment. An unexpected pregnancy, which would make her incredibly vulnerable in her community, and yet Mary welcomes the adventure that God presents to her. And not only does she welcome it, but a little bit further on, she sings this or says this hymn, which we call the Magnificat. Mary says, My soul glorifies or magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary not only receives the promise with faith, she engages and recognizes that in this child that she is going to mother, God has begun to turn everything upside down. God has begun to do exactly what her uh, cousin's baby John pronounced, that he would bring down the high places and raise up the low places, making a plain, preparing the way for the Messiah. Mary recognizes that in this child, the kingdom of God begins. And that great project of making all things new has begun. Verse 46, Mary's first line in this beautiful poem says, My soul magnifies. The literal meaning of the word that's translated magnifies is makes great and it suggests a continual action. Mary is bearing witness to the action of God in the world. She is calling out the fact and choosing repeatedly to continue to tell that story that the child that she carries is the beginning of God's great reversal. Mary recognizes and welcomes the opportunity that God is giving her to participate with him in the redemption of all things. And she's doing it with joy. She's doing it with a song in her heart. I have to admit that this is amazing to me. That to be presented with such a great challenge and the immediate response of her heart is faith and joy. I want you to notice something else. Notice the echoes of this poem that Mary pronounced, that Mary spoke on the news of her pregnancy with Jesus. I want you to notice the echoes of what Jesus pronounces as his mission 
a little later in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 4 when he begins his public ministry in Nazareth by reading this text from Isaiah. Some people have called this Jesus' mission statement. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And then he dropped the mic. <laughs> Notice that the beginning, the very, very beginning of Jesus' ministry, when the, when the angel announces to Mary that she is to bear a child, that her song of response names all of these things. And then when Jesus begins his ministry and quotes the great prophet Isaiah, he says exactly the same thing. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So then the question, as always, becomes, well, what about us? What does this mean for us? I think it means a couple of things. The first is this, as we've been saying all through this series, it points to the fact that God has an amazing affection for everyday, non-remarkable, broken, unimportant insignificant people and he invites them to participate with him in announcing good news to the poor, freedom to the captive, to, to um, sight for the blind, to announce good news and God's favor that is available to all people. God has a penchant, an affection a deep desire to see normal, everyday people invited in to his story. Now, one of the things that I want to recognize is that oftentimes life has a way of knocking us down. Life has a way of making us question our place. In any number of different ways, this can happen, right? It can happen through unmet expectations, failures that are either in or out of our control, um, lives and careers and uh, relationships, whether they be with our parents or with our children, uh, that don't turn out the way that we thought they would, all kinds of things which seem to conspire together to to push us down and say, just sit down and be quiet. You don't have anything to offer. And yet, repeatedly, the Scriptures witness to us that God chooses to use those very same people to not only announce, but to participate in, to inaugurate, to um, bring about his kingdom work in the world. Jesus wasn't born in Herod's palace. He wasn't born to a princess. He was born to an unwed Palestinian peasant. Who descended from the line of Rahab. You remember Rahab, right? The prostitute or the or the madam, or the innkeeper, whatever, whichever way you want to look at it. I wonder, friends, if the message for us in Mary and Elizabeth is in their trust that God's favor was upon them. 
I know this can seem hard to believe, but God's favor rests on all people. That is the good news of Jesus' story. The very beginning of the story, when the angel appears to the shepherds, he says, and peace to those on whom God's favor rests. And he's not talking about some select group. He's talking about humanity. All of us. Mary and, Liz- Mary and Elizabeth seem to have this faith and joy that God's favor really does rest on them. How do we find that joy? Well, I think we find it by resting in the truth that God's favor is present in the coming of Jesus. God's favor is present in our lives in the coming of Jesus. It is not reliant on our busyness or our laziness. It is not reliant on our success or our failure. It is not reliant on anything that we do. It simply is because God has announced it to be so, and Jesus came and proved through his resurrection that it was true. It is not up to us to produce it. Life cannot take it from us. It is promised in the promised one who came to Bethlehem, and the one who is coming again. All that we can do is to prepare our hearts like Mary and Elizabeth to receive it and to say, may it be to us just as you have proclaimed. Amen.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you are empowered now and forever by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to a broken and hurting world. Go and share God's favor 